Part three of the Hell's Bells anti-rock and roll documentary promises to tell us about the fruit of rock. I, uh, I don't know what that means, really. If it means we get to listen to a lot of Bananarama or the soundtrack to the Apple, then I am all for this. Though the beginning wants to get one thing perfectly clear. MTV bumpers used to be awesome, and then God punished Adam and Eve by taking the music videos away. Something about Eric Holmberg looks a little different here. I think they've been recording this for so long that it's nighttime out, so there's no sunlight coming in through the windows, and his hair seems a little wetter, like he took a shower between the two parts. You know, life can sometimes be confusing. Yeah, it is confusing. Why do you look different in this section? Oh, he changed shirts. That's why he looks different. With all the different opinions and religious views that vie for our attention, it can be hard to know what is good and what is bad. It's not that hard. And watching Hell's Bells, The Dangers of Rock and Roll, that's not good. That's bad. He says that the way to tell what is good and what's bad is if it's of God or of the devil. Apparently there's no in-between. And these edits? Also bad. It's obvious that something has gone very wrong with much of contemporary rock. Another very effective method, however... I didn't put any cuts in here. Suddenly he just teleported to a set at Troma Studios. I see him with plants. This better mean we get scientific again. Like when he hard-boiled an egg himself and said that rock and roll did it. These plants are here to represent the Bible's teachings that a false prophet will only produce bad fruit. Now sometimes when trees or plants are growing, it's difficult to tell them apart. No, it's not. This is going to be a fantastic test. I hope to God he plays Exile on Main Street and it grows spoiled oranges. He doesn't, though. That's the end of the plant test. He just quotes more scripture. Even now, the axe is laid to the root. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and burned. Because that's easier than just not eating the fruit. Much like how Eric should just not listen to this music and move on with his day. I think it's really hilarious that through the fruit and rock music analogy, the word bollocks is written in big letters right by him. But in this section, we learn that rock music is much like the teachings of Satan because they all want to steal, kill, and destroy. So he uses the Rolling Stones' Sympathy for the Devil as an example. It's a song about the devil boasting about his role in several atrocities throughout history. How do you disagree with this? This is taken from Gimme Shelter, because sure, Sympathy for the Devil is the worst thing that happened at that show. Oh, don't worry, they reference the deaths too, because Satanism caused it to happen. I wonder what born-again Christian Alice Cooper would say about your documentary. Or when you have musicians saying that they're not in control of themselves anymore when they're on stage, as if they're to be taken literally like Pazuzu is doing it to them. It also blames rock music for people being trampled to death at concerts. <laughs> the same thing has happened in the name of Christmas. There's a section here on self-mutilation in the punk rock scene, and none of this self-mutilation can even compare to the mutilation that Eric did to his own hair. But there's one cameo I wasn't expecting. We are all profoundly affected by the lord of whichever kingdom we're a part of, whether we are aware of it or not. Does he think Tim Curry from Legend is really the devil? It goes a step further by blaming rock music for serial killers, such as Richard Ramirez being affected by the ACDC song Night Prowler. Various religions have also caused the same thing, and more often. I'm not sure this is the road you want to go down. It's just going to be you going, what about this person? And me saying, yeah, but what about this person? And you going, what about this person? Hell, they even take Jim Morrison at his word that he killed someone. Uh, I don't know how to tell you, but uh, I killed somebody. Jim Morrison's on enough drugs that he probably thinks he's being interviewed by a six-foot-tall armadillo. Oh, it must be morning now because I see there's some better light coming in through the windows. Anyway, rock is the cause of all bad things. No one of Tommy's age and background could have committed this perverted and violent a crime 
without something to help him. Yet neither alcohol or drugs played a part. What then could it have been? Oh, you mean like mental illness or do those not exist? Nope, definitely metal music and metal alone caused all of this. I mean, look at how popular the music of the occult is. You can't get much more metal than the dirty dancing soundtrack. She's like the wind. Hmm, sounds like witchcraft to me. But remember, he's just putting this stuff out there. It's really innocent, really. Now, I'm not saying that if you listen to heavy metal music, the devil will make you kill your mom. <laughs> yeah, you are. Or at the least, you want your viewers to think that. He blames Satan for pushing people away from God. But docs like this push more people away from Christianity than Satan does. I think he has a reply to my criticisms, though. Now, some would say, so what? It's all just in fun. Nobody is supposed to take the message seriously. Well, that sentiment completely ignores both the nature of man and the power of music. Take some freaking responsibility and go see a therapist. You can't get into the whole rock causes murder angle without also getting into rock causes suicide. Again, religion's caused the same thing, and I don't hate religion. He blames Metallica's Fade to Black for being a huge contributor to suicide. The song is about depression and suicide, which actually caused people to write to the band and express how the song really helped them. Oh, come on, you also hate spring break? And by hedonism, do we mean you can do anything you please no matter how wild, strange, or excessive? Hell yes! Does Eric think that Bon Jovi started The Purge? Eh, but he's got a doctor on his side, though. It was thought that the way to prevent suicide among teens was to treat depression. It's not the case with these kids. Rather than being clinically depressed, these young suicide victims are impulsive, acting out fantasies. So you should probably treat that. Who knew until this documentary that there's a lot of punk rock songs that sing about some dark stuff? I thought that if I went to a punk show, they'd all be singing God Said to Noah There's Gonna Be a Floody Floody. This documentary is like if an atheist put out a documentary saying rock music is religious propaganda because DC Talk exists. I've been saying that perhaps there's just a lot of people out there with serious mental illnesses, but I guess even treating that is bad. The Greek word in the scriptures for sorcery, in fact, is pharmakia, from whence we get our words pharmacy or pharmaceuticals. In other words, drugs. <laughs> okay, pray the bad thoughts away. Look, just give me some ibuprofen. I have a headache. Drugs are apparently hated by God because they're a form of sorcery. Oh, people were getting messed up on all kinds of hallucinogens in the Bible. They could take something like nutmeg and cinnamon and turn it into a week-long party. But what's really bad is when music and lyrics are written with the help of drugs and alcohol binges. I got no room to talk. It's how I wrote most of my earlier movies. I don't know what Eric wants anymore. I can't deny that there's a moment when I'm transformed, when all of a sudden God is speaking through my strings. How's that a bad thing? Isn't that what you want? We don't need drugs. We got rock and roll. Yeah. Rock and rolls are hot. Yeah. See? Who needs cocaine? If we're taking everyone here literal, that means that they don't do drugs because of rock. Oh, and Wanted Dead or Alive is his example of pushing an alcoholism agenda. It's a song about their love for heroes of the Old West and the similarities between that and bands on tour. Guess you have to hate westerns now. Even comedians are targets here. It's like Christians against Christ. Rock created drugs. Because I'm sure Sam Kinison literally thinks that drugs didn't exist before rock and roll. Now we get into sex, and I should probably weigh in on this. Sexual freedom is something we feel is very important as a necessary requisite of the satanic church. Hmm, I don't remember saying that, but it's right there on film. Eric blasts people for saying sexual freedom is important, so I guess that means he wants a sexual dictatorship, or he's just pissed at Kiss. Do you know how many women you've slept with, say, in the past uh, five years? Five years? No. Over the last ten years, yes. Okay, ten. Over 2,000. Oh, so Eric's just jealous. He and his followers are secretly jerking off to this, aren't they? He probably flayed his dick with his own palm while doing the quote-unquote research here. Sex is what rock and roll is all about. So, what else? From the hip-shaking of Elvis the Pelvis in the 60s to the blatant perversity of the 80s. 
Elvis was a Christian, but the sin of rock and roll is right there in its name. Even the term rock and roll, coined by Cleveland disc jockey Alan Freed, is a euphemism for sex in the backseat of a car. Actually, he uses the term as an amalgamation between rhythm and blues and country music. Eric says that it's really just sexual exploitation that he hates. Mmm, where do those issues come from? You want to talk about it? I've seen movies that say they're about old-fashioned romances, but are way more destructive to sex than any salt and pepper song you've pulled clips from. This is all just getting a high from moral supremacy. George Michael's I Want Your Sex is not made for you. He outcries about how bad STDs are, and then in the same section is against the teachings of safe sex. You can't be mad at both. And it ain't just George Michael. It scarcely needs mentioning that George Michael and songs like I Want Your Sex are just the tip of the iceberg. Right? George Michael is a gateway to Robert Palmer with a song about finding someone attractive. He plays Bobby Brown's On Our Own video from Ghostbusters 2, and Bobby Brown's not even the biggest sexual deviant in that video. I don't think Eric went on a lot of dates in school. The vast majority of rock artists have become the moral equivalent of prostitutes in the temple of rock and roll. They're not prostitutes. Even if they were, Jesus would still hang out with them. They play she -bop and talk about it being a celebration of masturbation. <laughs> the horror! Look, ladies, you should all listen to Eric. He knows what's best for you and your body. Ooh, but remember, kids might be watching. Decency prevents us from playing some of the worst examples. As a sample, however... That didn't stop you from showing gruesome news footage earlier. His example of indecency is Van Halen. I don't really care what he says at this point. Like, I really want a lesson on decency and manners from the guy who called Madonna an ex-porn star and people who sing about sex prostitutes. Here, satanic sex is just sex if you enjoy it too much. It's all in the Bible, son! The deceptiveness of sin hardens our hearts. Um, a quarter flash saying harden my heart, not the bangles. It's hard to deliver that without sounding exactly like the cinema snob. I guess Satan has good music taste. How satisfying it must be for him to see the pinnacle of creation, people made in the image of God, performing acts not worthy of animals. Uh, there's a lot of artists that you've shown through this whole thing that are Christian, and I think Satan's more pleased about things like genocide than he is just a gigolo. It's not so much that people like sex, it's that sex is the religion of the rock star, with examples being Strange Love by Depeche Mode. It's a song about a relationship and the bad things that happen in that relationship, like cheating, not religion. Apparently, rock music is the biggest dealers in sex with their promotion of sexual violence. Guess you've made that case. Clearly, these artists are all pro-rape. This theme is amplified by the cramps on this album. Pornographic from beginning to end. Yeah, it's all pornographic. Except it's not. The words to women need are too obscene to repeat here. Oh, but we'll show you this mock decapitation. They repeat themselves again by doubling back to George Michael. This doesn't need to be three hours. Michael's worldview gives no place to either scripture or the church. It's not supposed to. Not everything is made for you and the church. I've never been more convinced than in this section that this whole thing is just Eric working through his issues. Taking this theme even further is the homosexual group, the Frogs. <laughs> it's taken 90 minutes to get into some gay panic. Their album cover features a very young boy wearing a pink triangle, a symbol within the militant homosexual movement. Well, it started out as a Nazi concentration camp badge to identify homosexuals, and then in the 70s, it was changed to a protest symbol against homophobia. So I guess it's the against homophobia part that upsets you the most. Eric likes his music like he likes his porn, manly. This blasphemy finds its axiomatic expression inside the album cover for another openly homosexual group. Frankie goes to Hollywood. I know what part scares Eric the most. It's the lyric, relax, don't do it, or you'll catch the gay. 
Because when I look at this image, I see the portrait of a straight man's man who's the peak of straightness. Even today, he gets all kinds of work. He could easily be an extra in any production of the Ritz. Obviously, they bought more than they could at the produce department. So in part four, we're going to get into the fruit of rock continued. There was barely enough in the bowl for one fruit of rock section. But Eric will be damned if you don't take this whole bag of peaches and shove it up your ass to get out of watching more of this. Bananarama's remake of the hit Venus and its attendant music video brought out some of the spiritual implications that were probably missed by most listeners when the song was first heard in 1969.